Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We now have, of course, the results from the Republican primary for Wyoming's lone at-large congressional seat. Congressman Liz Cheney, vice chair of the January 6th committee, was, well, annihilated, as we expected. She lost by a resounding 37 points, 28.9 percent to 66.3. Wyoming voters overwhelmingly rebuked Cheney, who, of course, stood up to Donald Trump after his insurrection, voting to impeach him and then helping to lead the committee investigating his actions. Now, Liz Cheney has earned a lot of praise, especially in liberal circles, for taking a stand against Trump and his attempt to end America's constitutional republic. Fellow January 6th committee member, Congressman Jamie Raskin, has spoken incredibly fondly about her, recently telling the New Republic that she has acted with great honesty to confront the lies of the Trump machinery. Raskin also said about his unlikely friend, quote, she will follow Donald Trump to the gates of hell if she needs to make sure that justice is done and that truth is known. And there's no doubt Liz Cheney has made genuine career political sacrifices on behalf of American democracy. That was <laughs> evident last night, almost as soon as polls closed. And what she has done is praiseworthy and important. But it's also the case that, you know, Cheney's a bone deep reactionary, a conservative to her core, and also, crucially, a partisan Republican. None of that's changed. And as strange as it may seem, she has, I think, taken this course of action in an attempt to save the Republican Party. This morning on the Today Show, Liz Cheney laid out her case. Look, I think the Republican Party today um, is is uh, in very bad shape, and I think that uh, we have a tremendous amount of work to do. I think it could take several election cycles, but uh, the, the the country has got to have a Republican Party that's actually based on substance, based on principles, you know, based on uh, a belief in limited government and low taxes and a strong national defense. A belief that the part that the family has got to be the center uh, of our community and of, of our lives and uh, those are the principles i believe in that's what the party used to stand for and and we've got to get the party back to that now i will leave aside my own significant quibbles with the definition of what the party used to stand for you'll notice just to make one observation she omitted the torture program the war crimes that were championed by her father and endorsed by her from that list but the key point here is that in her own understanding, Congresswoman Cheney is standing up to Donald Trump, not just for the sake of American democracy, but for the sake of the institutional vitality and indeed survival of the Republican Party itself. And I think she is right on this. And I think it's underappreciated how right she is by everyone. Because here's the thing. A conservative party in a two-party liberal democracy like ours, which is what the Republican Party is and has been, cannot continue to thrive or even exist if the MAGA authoritarian cult takes over. There is no space for that institution in the world in which Donald Trump is successful, in which he successfully overturns American democracy, which is to say, to save the Republican Party, you actually must save American democracy. And somehow, Liz Cheney seems to be one of the only members of her party to grasp this elemental truth, or at least one of the only ones to act on it. The other Republican cowards cannot muster the same courage to do what she has done to save their own hides in the end. Instead, they have dealt with this tension between the need to, again, preserve American democracy and their desire to win elections, retain their jobs, by basically going along with whatever Donald Trump says, winking and nodding and evading sometimes, pretending they didn't hear it. And that's basically the consensus view. That appears to be the calculation that everyone from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has made. Now, the Republican who's been the most forthright about his thinking on this, actually, is Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. Graham, of course, not always a fan of Donald Trump. In fact, he has made a real U-turn since that 2016 campaign. Here's what I think. I think Donald Trump is a political car wreck. He's a race baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. He's a jack <laughs> Donald Trump is not strong. He's actually weak. He's a bully. He's a cartoon character. Donald Trump is the most unelectable Republican I've seen in my lifetime. He shouldn't be commander in chief. He's destroying the party. There'd be a generation before we can overcome this. Maybe never. You know how you make America great again? Tell Donald Trump to go to hell. Now, Graham 
I suppose to his credit, has been very honest about why he has come around on Donald Trump. This is what he said at a right-wing pro-Trump summit just last month. If you think Trump is bad for the party, I disagree with you. I think President Trump is good for the party. And let me tell you why. President Trump has gotten people who wouldn't give me or Romney or anybody else the time of day. They believe that he is on their side. I'm trying to move toward a strong America, and he's the vehicle to get us there. Now, this is really interesting because actually, if you look at the earlier clips of Lindsey Graham and the latter ones, he's making the same argument. It's just about what Donald Trump does for the Republican Party, right? At first, he thought he was bad for the Republican Party. Now he's become convinced he's good. And the argument is basically, what are you going to do? The base loves him. And in the short term, to win elections for the Republican Party, Lindsey Graham is correct. The math just does not work for Republicans in this election or the one two years after to achieve reliable, broad victories without Donald Trump and his supporters. Doesn't work. But Graham and everyone who toes that line, right, they don't seem to have thought through what happens next. So you win some elections. Maybe you get power. What happens if Trump and his people win? These are people who are by their own words, right? Fundamentally opposed to the American system. What happens if you have people who think that Hugo Chavez's ghost hacked voting machines and the Chinese snuck in bamboo paper to steal an election? What happens when you have them running our elections? We're close to that. We're on the precipice of that. Under the Lindsey Graham strategy, that's what is going to happen if he's right. People come out and vote for them. What happens when that succeeds, when Trump succeeds? What happens when Trump succeeds where January 6th barely failed. I'll tell you what happens. And I think Liz Cheney would agree with me. The Republican Party, the thing we know as that, will not be preserved. If Donald Trump succeeds in his project of destroying American democracy, it will succeed in creating something entirely new, something very ugly, and let me tell you, incredibly unpredictable. And it will not be a world, I would be willing to bet, in which people like Lindsey Graham or Mitch McConnell or a lot of the rest of them thrive. Liz Cheney seems to be just about the only person in the party who recognizes this at a cellular level. Keep in mind, she is not a liberal in any way. She is a solid right winger. She was number three in House leadership. She voted in line with Donald Trump even more than Lindsey Graham did. She was with Trump just about every step of the way, even while he was essentially kidnapping children. She was with him until he tried to topple America's constitutional republic. And watching him attempt to assassinate American democracy made Liz Cheney realize that you cannot keep the tiger on the leash because he will eat you. She realized there is no future with Donald Trump, even for her most selfish, political, institutional interest, the Republican Party, to which she is an heir. What would there be left to rule except a kingdom of ashes if Trump is successful in his project? And if enough of her colleagues have realized it, too, if they had the fortitude and courage Liz Cheney has, they might have been able to do something about it. They had a moment, if they had collectively struck when they had the opportunity during the second impeachment trial, if they had voted to convict, bar him from future office, I don't think we'd be in this situation. But they were cowards. They were all cowards. And so Liz Cheney is alone. And we are going to see, all of us, how the Lindsey Graham strategy plays out. The Pennsylvania Senate race, Democrat John Fetterman, lieutenant governor of that state, has demonstrated from the get-go a very clear vision of how to run against his Republican opponent, millionaire TV doctor Mehmet Oz. Paint him as a rich, out-of-touch buffoon who does not live in, nor understand, the state he is ostensibly running to represent. Back in April, uh, Oz released a video, sort of standard stuff, attacking Democrats for high prices at the grocery store, and it has resurfaced this week. I thought I'd do some grocery shopping. I'm at Wegner's, and uh, my wife wants some vegetables for crudite, right? So here's a broccoli. That's two bucks. Not a ton of broccoli there. Here's some asparagus. That's four dollars. Yep. And carrots. That's four more dollars. That's ten dollars of vegetables there. And then we need some guacamole. That's four dollars more. And she loves salsa. Yeah, there's salsa there. Six dollars. Must be a shortage of salsa. 
Guys, that's $20 for crudite, and this doesn't include the tequila. I mean, that's outrageous. And we got Joe Biden to thank for this. <laughs> oh, I, I've watched that like 40 times now. It just keeps paying off. Uh, first, there's no star called Wegner's, which is what he says he's at. Oz probably meant to say Redner's, which is a Pennsylvania-based supermarket chain, but it got it confused with Wegmans, which is a fancier grocery chain in Pennsylvania and throughout the Northeast, with many locations in New Jersey, where Oz, of course, actually lives. And so Redner's and Wegmans became Wegner's. Didn't end there. Oz was trying to make the point that inflation was causing higher bills at the supermarket. But his choice of crudite, a French raw vegetable platter, was not the most relatable shopping experience. Oz showed a head of broccoli, a bunch of asparagus, and a very large bag of full-size carrots. You can get those little, you know, cocktail ones. But what he realized, the grand total was not that expensive. You could almost see him kind of panic midway through and go for the pre-made guacamole and salsa to just get those numbers up. Fetterman has been having an absolute field day with the video since it resurfaced earlier this week. In PA, we call this a veggie tray. And if this looks anything other than a veggie tray to you, then I am not your candidate. And I'm serious, Dr. Oz doesn't even know the name of the grocery store that he's in. Fetterman campaign is also now selling these Wegner's stickers captioned, let them eat crudite, which have contributed to a more than $500,000 fundraising haul for Fetterman's campaign since that video went viral. Even the conservative outlet, the very conservative outlet Newsmax, won't give Oz a pass for the gaffe. Let's talk crudite. If we can, is Dr. Oz relatable to the everyday hardworking American there in Pennsylvania? I joke about a crudite, which is a way of speaking about how ridiculous it is that you can't even put vegetables on a plate uh, in the middle of a campaign. We'll do what, whatever we need to do to make sure the people of Pennsylvania respect what we're about. And I mean to fixate on it, but I, I just for those watching in Pennsylvania, you know how particular many people are about their groceries. What happened with Wegmans and Wegners? Can you explain that to them? Yeah, I was exhausted <laughs> when you're campaigning 18 hours a day. You've, listen, I've gotten my kids' names wrong as well. So there's now another Oz gaffe making the rounds. The TV doctor recently said he owns two homes. How many houses do you own? Really hard, but, uh, well, I legitimately, I, I own two houses, but um, one of them we're building on. The other one's I rent. So... Oz claims he legitimately owns two houses and rents the other properties, but investigation by the Daily Beast found that he actually owns, I make this up, not 10 houses. He rents some of them out to other tenants as a landlord, but he's not renting them from someone else. Anyone who's ever rented understands there's a big difference between renting from and renting to. Now, it is still early, but this all explains why polling currently has Oz down double digits. The gap will narrow. We should consider this in every single battleground race statewide, basically close to a dead heat until Election Day. That's my operating assumption. But if Democrats are going to pull off a miracle and keep or even expand their Senate majority, they are going to need lots of help from walking, talking caricatures like Dr. Oz.